Hey, it's me, Stacey B. And I just wanted to let you know that you are in for a real treat with the interview I did with Dr. Renee Muller, who is the author of The Four Domains of Mental Illness, an alternative to the DSM. I will put the information uh, below on YouTube with the link to the page on my website that contains the articles and information that he sent me. And if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the comments on YouTube, or you can email me from the contact page on my website. Look forward to hearing what you think. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. Hey, it's me, Stacey V, and I am over the moon excited to be talking to Dr. Renee Muller, who is the author of The Four Domains of Mental Illness, an alternative to the DSM. Uh, Dr. Muller has evaluated in his career over 3,000 psychiatric patients in the ER and recounted the stories told to him there in numerous articles for the Psychiatric Times. Uh, which is the most widely read psychiatric publication in North America. Uh, he's also the author of Doing Psychiatry Wrong, a critical and prescriptive look at a faltering profession. And as I said, the book we're going to be talking about today, The Four Domains of Mental Illness. And I have been rocking my brain today trying to remember how I discovered this book. And the gatekeeper at my subconscious was not giving it up. So I don't remember where I stumbled across this, but it was revelatory to me as somebody who has had early trauma and, and, and lived in a time where early trauma was not even quant qualified in the mental health community. The first time I was in therapy was 1993. None of this language existed around trauma. The words trauma response or trigger or any of the words that are now in the mainstream vernacular had not even been coined in relation to this. So reading this book and understanding that the way I was and the way I was wired and the way I behaved wasn't my fault because I've read the DSM or a lot of it and I always felt judged. <laughs> <laughs> in reading the different diagnoses that I was given. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's jump into the interview. So Dr. Muller, can you explain a little bit of the history of both the DSM and the four domains of mental illness, the differences between them and why change from the DSM is so necessary? So uh, let's start with um, uh, the DSM-3, okay, which came out in 1980, edited by uh, Robert Spitzer. Now, this was a big change from what had come before and really isn't very much different from what we have now in five. We're up to the fifth edition, which came out uh, in, 19, in 2013. And that was almost no change at all from the DSM-4, which came out, I, I believe, eight years before that. So that's just a very quick overview of um, uh, how this has gone. It really hasn't gone very far as far as development. On the other hand, it has become one of the most popular books in the world. And you frequently see the word Bible of mental illness, a, ta a terrible way to put it, by the way, but you do see that a lot. And that gives you an idea of how ubiquitous uh, this has become. And it's not only North America, it's everywhere, okay? It's, it's, it's the planet. Okay, before, so back Before you go on, I just, it just dawned on me that there may be some people watching who aren't as familiar with it. I, I kind of take it for granted because I'm a psychology nerd. But the DSM is what therapists and psychiatrists use to provide a, diagno a mental health diagnosis for a patient this is what the insurance companies use in order to verify that you have a, um, a condition, illness, whatever word you want to call it, that is valid for them to pay your bills with a therapist or a psychiatrist. Is that correct? Oh, well, that's correct. So okay. there's a lot of um, proprietary stuff going on here. A lot of people are making their living off of this thing, okay? okay. That you've, got to, you've got to really understand. And when you think about changing something and why somebody wouldn't want to read my 160,000 word uh, uh, book, it's because they're making a hell of a good income and not having to 
expend a whole lot of mental energy on it. You know, this is mindless and brainless, this, this DSM. And again, to, to just to uh, say how they do this, uh, the diagnosis is based on um, uh, uh, checklists of symptoms, okay? And, and the thing is, these symptoms uh, are never, uh, uh, nobody probes the meaning of these symptoms. One symptom is uh, equivalent uh, to another if it fits the category, okay? And they have this thing, uh, patient fits uh, psychiatric um, criteria for this diagnosis. This is nonsense, okay? Absolute nonsense. Now, to get back to what Bob Spitzer was trying to do, uh, back in the 60s and 70s, say, if you use that as a starting point, psychiatry was a real mess. <laughs> Uh, of a different kind of real mess it is. Now, um, there were all kinds of different ways of looking at things. There are all these centers of, um, you know, of, of where you could go to learn to do this or that or the other thing. Psychoanalysis for a lot of that time was primary, okay? That came um, at, uh, over the ocean after the Second World War and became the main uh, academic focus of the university. You know, like you got your training at a university, uh, chances are you got um, uh, from the 40s on uh, uh, Freud and his followers. And there were a lot of his followers, some of whom really did a much better job, I think, than he did. I'm not a big uh, partisan of Freud. I come from a very different background, which we'll get into in a minute. But anyway, back to Bob Spitzer. What he wanted to do was find a way that people could agree on, it, you know what I mean, when they did a diagnosis. And this is called... Um, uh, reproducibility. Okay, so in other words, if you had a patient and you had five uh, mental health professionals, let's say psychiatrists, uh, uh, speaking to this person, you'd want them to come up with the same diagnosis, and not certainly not all over the field, which is what was going on, you know, before. So he said, "Look, what you can uh, count on uh, if you um, uh, uh, interview a patient is getting the symptoms." Okay, they can tell you they don't sleep, they don't eat, you know, they have thoughts of this and that and the other thing. Uh, they can't work anymore, uh, they don't have any energy, you know, or they have too much energy or, or whatever it is. This kind of descriptive uh, uh, thing that people could um, take out of the story, so to speak, all right? And what he did was he codified this for each uh, disorder, let's say depression, anxiety, the, uh, OCD, uh, a, a whole range of, 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 uh, of illnesses. And he came up with a, a list of symptoms and they did tests on this, you know. And they said, and they, they got to a certain point where they felt that this was more reliable and the reliable in the sense reproducible, um, not valid, because that validity is something entirely else, it's right. different. And they found that they had a, a reasonable degree of, um, of reproducibility or reliability when one person did it and the second person did it and the third person and so forth with the same interview, so to speak. You know, they probably taped these interviews and then had people sit in the room and, you know, uh, listen to the, the patient's story and then they would um, uh, uh, do the diagnosis. And apparently they found out that uh, at least this was better than what was going on before when you had Zen on one side and, you know, something else on the other side. So that was, that was hailed as a great success story. Okay, a great improvement over what they had before. And at and the same time, was. pardon me? I said, and it probably was, right? Over it what may have been. Before. See, I wasn't in the business then, so okay. I, I, okay. I didn't, I really kind of started with DSM-3, to tell you the truth. Okay. So I didn't, I have read about what goes on in the past, but I, I wasn't there at, at the, you know, at the creation of that. I was at the creation of DSM-3. Okay, that was actually the year I was at Duquesne in Pittsburgh, 1980. Okay. And that's the year DSM and Spitzer came out with that, that book. All right, now what else was I gonna say? Okay, all right. Meanwhile, as this was going on, there was a red hot neuroscience uh, program in action, okay? Uh, this was supposed to be the era of the brain and um, all the psychodynamic stuff was supposed to just be mumbo jumbo and they were trying to make psychiatry into a medical specialty, okay? Remember, this is uh, a, a part of medicine. And they were trying to put everything on a biological basis, you know what I mean? And they were doing all, they had these brain scans and they were doing all these uh, experiments with uh, synaptosomes, you know, and uh, analyzing 
uh, the uh, the brains of people who were you know ill and the people who had not been ill after they died, of course. And then they had scans. They had these brain scanners, which I think is the worst thing that ever happened to psychiatry, to tell you the truth, because they're able to see a picture. And you know we all love pictures, right? And uh, you see a picture, and it's different from uh, uh, what it was be before the patient became depressed, or it's, it was different with people who were not depressed or say they weren't depressed. And they got all excited about this to say, this is depression, you know, what they're seeing on the screen, all right? So, well, and this, this satisfied a lot of people because there was nothing else really in, in mainstream, you know what I mean, to uh, uh, capture their imagination. And, you know, Camus said that, uh, and other people have said this too, that a bad explanation is better than no explanation at all. What people can't stand is not having any explanation. And they will go to great lengths, including deceiving themselves, to come up with something, okay? Because that's your identity. If you don't know what's going on with something major in your life, you don't know who you are, okay? This is identity, and we all strive for that and make exceptional uh, uh, excuses for coming up with identity elements, if you will, you know, so that we can get by. And this is what happened with psychiatry with, uh, from uh, the DSM-3 on. So anyway, this, this science that was being developed, uh, this, uh, they poured, this became, see, everybody bought into this lie. That's the thing, that the brain, that all mental illnesses were brain diseases. And that's, that, that's what DSM-3, 4, and 5 say, okay? And this is, you'll see when we get to what I did, how I broke this up and how the uh, people at Hopkins did in the perspectives of psychiatry and how I refined that. This is, this is where we're going here. But meanwhile, we're stuck uh, in this uh, uh, biological uh, uh, trap that offers so much. And why do people believe it? Well, there's, there's something in this for everybody. Look, if you're, if you're feeling terrible, you have no idea what's going on with your screwed up life, and you know, if, if you can say, if you can believe what the psychiatrist says that it's because something in your brain is wrong that needs to be corrected with a medication, okay? That's a, that's a huge identity element, right? Who are, I'm sick, you know what I mean? It's, it's, that, that, that's, what, that's what that means. It's not my fault, nothing's my fault. Nothing is my doing, nothing is my creation. Uh, the brain calls the shots, and that comes a lot from genetics. That's the other part of this right. lot, okay? That genetics is that much determinative. And the word cause comes in here. Cause is a very interesting word. We use that word all the time, but in psychiatry, it's used in a very special sense. It means that there's a kind of essentially a one-to-one -one relationship be some, between some biological process and what's, what you're feeling. You know what I mean? Your mood, your, your state of awareness or uh, involvement or engagement, uh, uh, so forth. So um, this is this went on. And the, all right, so who, who benefits from this? The, the patient does. The doctor does because any damn fool can do this. You've got to understand that um, uh, going through a residency program in psychiatry in the medical model is a fool's game. All right. Anybody can do this because it's it's. It's, it's junk, all right? And who's not going to buy into this? Who's not going to want to go the easy route, okay? Who's going to want to spend years, you know, doing what I did? Can you see this? All right. <laughs> this 160,000-word um, uh, tome and taking the trouble to learn existential uh, uh, psychiatry and uh, 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 psychobiology and putting the two together. That's what I did in that book. Okay, who else benefits? Well, the drug companies do. They make a fort. You know the story of the drug companies. That's one of yep. the biggest scandals of all time, yep. right? And uh, they made a fortune out of this. And the people were very happy to take the pills. And uh, some of the, and we need to talk about pharmacology too a little bit about what it means to take an antidepressant, what it means to take an antipsychotic. We'll get to that, that later, but that's a very important part too. Um, so there was something in this for everyone. And even now that it's being proven in study after study that the original uh, studies that said these drugs really work well, they're finding out now, A, that the, that the studies were poorly designed, and B, that a lot of this effect yeah. is the placebo <laughs> effect. You know what I mean? You go in to the doctor and uh, he says, well, there's something wrong with your brain. You take this and it'll be better. Well, in, in, in a lot of cases, you're going to get better anyway. 
for one thing over time. You know what I mean? That that there's something about and because you, you, you talk about trauma, you're very interested in that. There's something about the human psyche that wants to heal itself on, over time, unless you put something in its way, or unless you have some huge deficit that's such a big hole in you that you can't heal. You know what I mean? And, and that's true. So a lot of people who have trouble with, um, uh, you know, with one thing or another, uh, will heal over time, and that they they admit that in the psychiatric literature. By the way, that's not that's not a secret, and they're not particularly trying to cover that up. Although they're not particularly trying to spread the word of that either. Of course, they want to keep the focus on the the neurons that are misfiring, you know, and uh, the drugs that um, uh, uh, offset that neuronal imbalance and bring the things back to normal. Okay, well, which there absolutely no, no proof and never was, and probably never well never will be okay all right now having said that what, what would you like me to go to next now oh, well, exactly. you, the, the dsm3 how the dsm3 does things they do it with checklists as you know you've seen this yep. and uh, the thing is uh, they don't bother to uh, find out what the meaning of these symptoms are and which means that I, and i say in here this is an open invitation this way of doing things an open invitation to get a diagnosis wrong it's well, that bad I have a quick anecdote here. So sure. I okay. was living in Tampa and knew somebody who had a friend who was interested in getting on disability and felt she had some mental issues. Long story short, I take this woman to her appointment. I am not kidding you. She was in there for less than a half an hour and came out with a bipolar two diagnosis. Yeah. Oh, and I yeah. was oh, like, okay. what the hell? You cannot take 20 minutes and diagnose somebody with bipolar two. That's just, and I'm, and I'm not, I mean, I don't have any, edu I don't have any formal education in this. Again, okay, now let me, all right, if I may go stop, ahead. Is it, one of the, the sections in this I'm most proud of is the way I destroyed the idea of bipolar two. Bipolar two is basically bullshit, okay? To quote my mentor, Paul McEwen Hopkins. <laughs> who uses that word so beautifully, 11 <laughs> years of Harvard, 11 years of Harvard behind that, and uh, has, has done such a, a great job exposing this stuff, okay? And uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. But I, I think bipolar one and two are two of the most wrongly diagnosed illnesses in the whole canon of uh, you know, of uh, uh, psychiatric diagnosis. I mean, total nonsense. I saw that time after time in the ER. I mean, you suck it. you get this person, you know, who's on drugs, and of course, actually, their mood is all over the place. And it says in the DSM, I'll give it this, that you're supposed to, you know, take that into consideration, let the drug effects wear off before you look at the mood swings and mood changes, and they do that. But a lot of clinicians don't do that, okay? They don't do that. And one of the nice things about working in the ER is, you know, in, in, in a way you can say this, and I, I come up with this, the ER is the best place and the worst place to try to diagnose a mental disorder. Let me explain. The good, the, the good news is, the bad news is it's just a snapshot. You only have the person for a couple of hours, okay? And that's not ideal. On the other hand, these people come in jacked up, you know, on the, maybe on the worst day of their lives and they're ready to deal. Okay, so if you're ready to deal, if you've learned how to focus, and this takes a while, this took me a couple of years out of the 10 years I put in before I was really up to full speed. You know, if you don't learn this in a book and no one tells you that you should know it, you get, I had to discover that for myself, okay? And I had to watch other people do this job who didn't really do it that well, okay? And, then, and because I had all kinds of very good training, I was able to uh, uh, adapt that to the ER. And I learned a great deal. And of course, I wrote all those articles for Psyche. I think I wrote about 35 articles for Psyche at the time. And they took everything I sent them. So, and they were really thrilled to get it. And there was a very good editor uh, at that time, a lady whom I worked with. And uh, we had a very, very good time for several years getting those articles out. Um, anyway, all right, that's the discovery part that you so can uh, what was the uh, what you can point? learn and what you can uncover, you know, when somebody is really in um, uh, um, in trouble. And I've asked many patients, I, do you think you're a schizophrenic? And said, no. I said, do you think you're a bipolar? No. And, and you can't discount that, you know. 
And other people will say, well, that's what the doctor told me. And, you know, they, they'll settle for that. So anyway, the, that's why I say the ER is both the best and the worst place to um, uh, uh, learn diagnosis. So what was so the, I interrupt you go on I'm sorry. That's okay. What was the was there a particular moment or was it a cumulative effect that you got to a point where you were like this is just crap. Yeah. What we are using to evaluate and and uh, diagnose and label people is just bullshit. Yes. Was it a cumulative right. effect? All right, let me, let me tell you. Do you know the famous Hemingway quote from The Sun Also Rises? That someone asks the question, how did Jake, whatever his last name was, go bankrupt? And the answer came back, uh, gradually, then all at once. Right, right, that, right. That, that, I, to me, I I, that. The first time I read that, I blew my mind. I knew what it was. And um, that's the way things happen in general in, in life. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, because we we don't want to admit sometimes what we see, and it takes a while. It's just, you've got to um, get uh, uh, you've got to have multiple exposures to things before you're really willing to admit what's going on. And by the way, that reminds me: don't let me off this show without talking about habit. Okay, habit and habit. Um, okay, habit. I will. Habit that and down. mental illness. Okay. Okay. We want to do that. It's a kind of a separate thing that blends into everything else. So all right, so so gradually then all at once, and um, it was a real it was a real learning curve, and um, uh, over three thousand patients over ten years. And I also did private practice. I mean, and I also worked in. I've done other things besides ER, but I love the medicine of it. Um, I love working with the doctors, the attendings, the ER attendings are great people, and um, I think I had one bad one out of thirty or thirty five that I worked with during that whole time. And I got to understand um, psychiatric medicine, which is one of, one of the things I wrote about. And that simply means there are uh, medical, disorder, medical diseases that produce psychiatric symptoms. Right. And the thing that you wanna do if you're a decent clinician, which so many people are not, is be able to rule out any medical or organic reason for these um, psychiatric symptoms before you start uh, trying to make a psychiatric diagnosis. And I had several I guess the uh, the Psyche R book that I wrote by like putting all those articles together for Psychiatric Times, one quarter of that is psychiatric medicine. And we have things like hyponatremia, um, uh, uh, thyroid problems, and uh, just and other things that, that uh, were, were medical in origin and produced psychiatric symptoms and that we had to work our way through. But some of them, some of them just had absolutely no idea. Uh, I, I ran into a psychiatrist who had never psychiatrist who had never heard of hyponatremia, which is what hyponatremia. Well, it literally means low sodium, and what happens is the, the way psychiatric patients get that is that they drink too much water. You know, the excessive water drinking. Have you ever heard of that? that it's a side it's, effect of yeah. So, yeah. Well, yeah, but I mean, certain uh, people just do this as a way of coping. And they, what they do, they reduce their sodium to the level where the balance of, of the of sodium and potassium in the brain changes, and their brain swells. Okay, and you can imagine what happens. That, that's why they uh, develop psychiatric symptoms. They become delirious, essentially, and okay. we have to be able to tease that out. But you see, one of the nice things about the ER is everybody goes in, gets that, um, uh, gets their blood drawn, and analyzed. And you can tell right away if the sodium is, is they have a very strictly established limits for what's okay and not okay right, right. for serum sodium concentration, okay? So you can see that right away. And that is one of the nice things about the ER. And we had people who were repetitive water drinkers who would come in in relapse, so to speak, in psychiatric relapse. And what we have to do in a case that way, where you don't send them up to the psych ward, you send them to the uh, uh, intensive care unit and they sit on them for a couple of days and give them um, uh, uh, saline solution until right. they balance it out again. Okay, all right, a little bit of a diversion. But that, that all, the other thing is that gave me a very good insight into the difference between what um, the brain can do to cause psychiatric symptoms and what the psyche can do, okay? Remember, I, I sent you that, did I send you that? Um, you did, I will, I will find a way to get we'll those get up on that. my we'll website. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But um, uh, all right, w what's the next thing you want to talk so, about? So at what point did you say, I need 
to correct this. And and I kind of would imagine, and maybe I'm wrong, that you were viewed a little bit as a heretic in terms oh. of <laughs> saying these kinds of, this is the reason I love you, is because, right. you know, I mean, I was born with my thumb on my nose toward authority, um, to which the universe promptly responded, we're making her a Catholic for the first 18 years of her life. Um, but, you know, at, at what point did you say, I need to start doing something more formally yes. well, to help reverse this? Somewhere, somewhere in that first five years, I guess, or maybe okay. the seventh year while I was writing those articles. And uh, the, the tone of my articles changed because it got critical. And then Psychiatric Times got mad at me for that. Because, see, the thing is, I really bought into the, 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 uh, the basic paradigm when I started out. Well, it's even what though you were I taught. Whole, there I was taught, of course, even though I had all this existential background, I didn't put it together, okay? I had, what I had to see was the wrong diagnoses, all those wrong diagnoses in the ER. That's, that was the, uh, the, the trigger, if you will. Um, and uh, then, then what I did, I wrote a book called Doing Psychiatry Wrong. You mentioned that. And that, is, that was the, I, I sort of exposed the problem, okay? And so that was what led to creating the four domains. Yes, exactly. That was a, uh, 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 an extension of, it was the next step. And that's a story now, if, if you want me to, to, to venture into that, I can tell you how that came together because that's a very interesting story. And it, uh, I have some uh, people I need to thank for that, of course. Are you ready for, to, hear, are you, sure. to hear that? Okay. Um, while I was doing this work, and even before I was, even before I went to Duquesne, for some reason, I would go down to the psychiatry seminars at Johns Hopkins. And they have this, of course, Adolf Meyer was um, uh, uh, the influence for, for that department. And uh, I didn't know anything about Adolf Meyer. And I, I loved these, these seminars. I went every week for years. And uh, every once in a while, Paul McHugh, who was chairman at the time, uh, would give a, a public talk on Adolf Meyer, you know, whom I had never heard of. Uh, until I started going down there. And um, I think maybe I heard three or four talks from him before I decided, before I realized what was going on here, how similar this was to the existential uh, way of looking at things that I had developed working with Ralph Harper at Hopkins right here on this campus um, at, uh, at Homewood and um, at Duquesne in Pittsburgh, the year I spent there. You know, this is um, Husserl, Heidegger, Sartre, Merleau-Ponty. Did you have any of that faculty? When, did you take psychology when you were- I, I did as an undergrad. I did my undergraduate at Duquesne right. and Who I did don't you have? What teachers? Did you have either of the Fishers, Connie or Bill? This was back in 1982, so. Okay. All right, well, that was the year after I was there. So, well, I started in 81. I was there okay. from 81 to 85. Okay, all right. They were there then. My, the people who taught me graduate courses probably taught you undergraduate courses. You want to look that up sometime and tell me. Okay. okay. It's, it's, it's interesting to know between you and me. Okay, so anyway, uh, this went on for a period of years. And um, uh, I just became more and more uh, interested in this. And then one day, um, oh, I was... I wanted to meet McHugh because I had never, never met him. And uh, I knew Dick Maxey very well, who was head of the humanities section here, the um, department here. And I asked him to introduce us and he did. And uh, we got to know each other. And uh, he gave me, I remember in 2000, in 2000, he gave me a signed copy of his Perspectives of Psychiatry, okay? And I read it. I, I think I took off four days and read it through and never had to look at it again because it was so, you know, I was so attuned to what he was doing that it just, I had learned a lot of it before and it just clicked, you know? And over a period of time, I got really um, uh, into this uh, idea of the perspectives. He divided this up into four um, uh, 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 parts, which come from Meyer, okay? It's, and I, I don't think he'd be, say that in, in perspectives that that's exactly how it happened, but I can point to, the, to an article in, um, in, in the Meyer uh, anthology that I read that um, where he says this. 
So in other words, it's Meyer to Paul McHugh and to me and how we get from, from uh, get to the, uh, the four domains. So, all right, let me just uh, read to you here what these um, uh, domains were. Uh, stories, uh, dimensions, behaviors, and diseases. Okay, now I have trouble believing that uh, these are the best ways to name these four categories, okay? I think this is very confusing and I pointed out in the book here because I have to you know, give my uh, due credit um, to uh, uh, McHugh and uh, Paul Slavny, uh, who was the, also the co-author, by the way. It's McHugh and Slavny. Um, and uh, I, I guess what I was able to do was to see what they were doing from an analytical perspective, largely. I was able to add the existential part to this. And that's what the step between the four perspectives of psychiatry and the four domains of mental illness are. Okay? That, that synergy that I created by just bringing those two paradigms together. Now, one question I uh, continue to ask myself is why the hell did it take me to do this? Why didn't they see this? When, because they are, were very um, interested in Carl Jaspers, who was an existentialist. But they, they, they went part way, but they couldn't go the whole way because they didn't know enough existential philosophy. And of course, I have learned that uh, here at Hopkins from uh, Ralph Harper. Um, word about Ralph, uh, he was uh, trained at Harvard um, and uh, he did some work at Oxford. And uh, he was asked to actually translate Being in Time, the big book from uh, Heidegger, from German into English. He was this as a very young man, he turned that down because he said that if he did that, he wouldn't be able to do his own work. And uh, just but to show you how uh, he was thought of at, at that time. And he, Ralph was an Episcopal priest, by the way. He had a parish out in Moncton. And uh, he, had, he was an adjunct professor here at Hopkins. And when I was finishing up my degree in chemistry, uh, I was using my boss's office over here in Dunning and uh, his mail used to show up on, on his desk initially, and then he'd come over and read it later on. But I was using that office to write my dissertation. And one day I see this flyer from the uh, Johns Hopkins Press. And um, uh, there's this book by uh, 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 Ralph Harper, whom I'd never heard of before, on existentialism, which I was phenomenally interested in already on my own. So um, I asked around and uh, there were people I knew who knew him. And I guess I just showed up at one of his classes once and introduced myself to him. And uh, from that point on, um, he uh, uh, sort of became my mentor. I took a number of classes from him, bought it, bought it them. I didn't take them for credit. And he read every chapter of my first book, The Marginal Self, uh, uh, chapter by chapter. And that was back in, the, that was before personal computers. And I would type it out, send it out to him. And uh, three or four days later, the, the response would be under my door from the mail. You know, he sent it back in a big envelope. And the postman would put it under the door with very, very good comments and uh, very good in the sense of corrective a lot of the times. But I worked with him for a number of years. And by the way, if anybody is ever interested in getting into the existential side, of anything, um, the philosophical side, although a little bit of psychology comes into that book. Read The Marginal Self. That's my first book. Okay. Um, and that's, I, 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 I have no interest in retracting anything or doing anything with that book. If they were to, um, it's, it's out of print now, although there are millions of copies out there. There's also an online version, of course, a couple of electronic versions. But The Marginal Self um, was my, it was really an, an analysis of my own life, but I didn't say that in the book. I, I didn't put myself in it at all, but I was really looking to myself to work some things through in that book, and uh, I did it. All right, anyway, so here I am going down to Hopkins to these seminars and uh, hearing the cue now and then talk about um, uh, Adolf Meyer, and I'm saying, Jesus Christ, I mean, this is, you know, why aren't these guys, why are these two fields so far apart? You know what I mean? You got this one camp over here, the other, they're really saying the same thing, but they're not talking to each other and they're not realizing their similarities. So then I saw a way bringing those two camps together to take the next step up out of the DSM and into 
uh, this here. This is um, this is really, in a way, the core of the book. I called it a map of the four domains. It's an appendix in the back, and um, um, it's got all this breakdown of the of the four uh, uh, the four per, uh, domains as they and as they relate to the four perspectives. So you can look, and in the book I explain uh, why I think that the way Hopkins did it. Uh, was not, see, the thing is about the, the perspectives is they never intended that to be a diagnostic manual. And this is deliberately uh, what I um, set out to do, to, to take the, uh, uh, the four perspectives, uh, uh, turn those into the four domains, and then come up with this diagnostic schema, if you will. That's right, not, so if I understand correctly, and especially for those who are really more lay people, and so, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Sure. But the umbrella under which you classify things takes into consideration that yes, there are some biological brain disorders that, as you said, that cause psychiatric symptoms. So that's one category. But that you that's, that's the fourth. Right. That's the last. That's the that's the last one. Right. Right. The right. last one. Right. But that. Instead of, but the other three categories focus right. more on the stories of people than the symptoms, which is what the DSM focuses on. Right. And, well, and the DSM right. has an issue, in my opinion, with the symptoms because they use the same word for so many different things. Right. You got it. Or they use, am I bad? Reverse. They use so many different words. For the same thing, like right, and well, that's what I that's what I heard when you when you said that I I transferred it when in my right in my head. right because right, they right. use sure. you know as far as moods elevated expansive irritable but they all mean angry because right. I think I had shared with you that at one point in my checkered past I was a life coach in an ex offender reentry program yes yes and. Uh, I, I remember thinking after, and I had no experience, they threw me into the deep end without the floaties, okay? Because wh when I started that job, I was the only one in the, in the office to start at that time. And they put the brochures on my desk and at the bottom it said, access one diagnosis required. And I was like, what the hell is that? <laughs> and I had to Google it. And I'm now responsible for mentoring and coaching people who have major depressive disorder, PTSD, either one of the bipolars, and I forget what the other one is. And I don't even, I have no training in this. So I went into it completely as an observer almost, not really knowing anything. And I'm talking to these men and women, and I remember saying to someone about six months in, when is the DSM going to come up with a diagnosis for pissed off? Because yeah. at the end of the day, you know, when you've got to live, when you're living in a house and you look out the window and you don't know whether the Aaron's rent to center truck is there to deliver furniture or it's a DEA undercover bust. I mean, that level of unknowing and stress right. and pre it's just how does it not mess with you as a human being well, think, think of what that does to your identity i mean it shatters it you have no shatters identity it. under those conditions okay? exactly exactly and i learned so much from working with these guys um and, and i remember it's funny i was going to talk about this later but it, it fits now i remember we, we had a, we had a psychiatrist in the, you know, as part of the program, because they all had to see her once a month and, of course, get their meds refilled. Sure. Um, and, and I remember saying to her, I have this theory that if the Axis 2 personality disorders go untreated, that they end up, and now knowing what your take is on it, it's not exactly correct, but that they, they evolve into what is qual quantified as an axis one or the serious mental illness disorders through the DSM. That if you keep, and you know, maybe this is a time where we can talk about it later to, to talk about the habits that you had mentioned with mental health. Because, you know, if you're already running down a trail where you're making bad decisions and you've got a bunch of habits that are affecting your ability to function in a healthy way, how does that not just strengthen itself as it rolls down the hill 
It does. I mean, that's that's the thing. And the thing is, that's the psychodynamic thing. That and of course, the DSM wouldn't mess with something like that. You know what I mean? That's not their kind of thing. No, because they want ca separate categories. They right. want you know. And I don't believe they're using the axes anymore. I believe I read that somewhere. But but the second axis at the time in the DSM four was the personality disorders. Right. And. And then again, the axis one was the stuff that required medication. And the DSM thing really seemed to me that, well, nobody in the program I was in was permitted entry without an axis one. So they had to be taking medication. Sure. But they all came out of prison where they're yeah. doping them so they don't cause problems with their bad yeah. habits. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's just this vicious cycle. Well, that's what, you know, people get themselves into this and they have that, no way to get out of it. They, you know, they're in trouble to start with and they get in, uh, into this and then they get into these drugs. And if you, I don't know whether you've ever watched psychiatric drugs, you know, destroy people, but that happens all the time. I mean, they're terrible. And this, let's get, this brings back something I wanted to talk about. What does it mean to say that a drug is an antidepressant? Now, what they, what they told you for years and years, but they don't anymore because it's a lie that's been exploded, is that actually in the neurons and the, uh, uh, the neurotransmission pads that are responsible for mood in the limbic system of the brain, this is, there is a disorder there that there is not enough um, uh, um, of norepinephrine or serotonin, whatever, in the transmission line. So that, that's why you feel bad and that these drugs that you take increases that. Well, that's completely ridiculous, okay? But it's a wonderful idea. You can draw on the board, you know, these, um, uh, what they call them cartoons of the presynaptic and postsynaptic neuron, and then the ligand of the, uh, uh, the antidepressant binds to the presynaptic um, uh, uh, neuron, and that increases the amount of neurotransmitter in the cleft, and that upregulates the signal, and therefore, you, you're not depressed today. Well, that's nonsense, okay? Now, some of those um, uh, antidepressants do act as stimulants, okay? Some of them do, the, particularly the, the serotonin uptake rehibitors, uh, SSRIs. They, they, are, uh, they are stimulants. And if you take stimulants, you're gonna feel better, okay? It doesn't mean it's reversing the depression. It's just kind of countering, you know, for years and years, people, they had what they call tinctures of cocaine. Yeah. So the drug is sold legally. It and that made people- Yeah, Coca-Cola yeah, Coca <laughs> also. Uh, but I mean, druggists uh, had preparations of this that you could buy, the doctors could write prescriptions for. And naturally you're gonna feel better if you have some co 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 uh, cocaine dissolved, cocaine hydrochloride, the soluble uh, 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 formulation of that. Uh, if you drink that, you're going to, sure, you're going to feel better. But that doesn't mean it's reversing your depression. Right. Okay. The other thing, antipsychotics. Um, there, there are many reasons why people become psychotic. And I do, I do an extensive job of that in this book. Okay. Uh, I have a two and a half, I think two and a half chapters on schizophrenia because I work with schizophrenics. And um, I, uh, uh, got a sense of what this was and just as much what it was not because there are a lot of people walking around with that diagnosis who, you know, they're not. But the thing is, in order to be able to make that call, you need to be understand how, you need to understand how some people can, can become psychotic um, uh, psychodynamically. Because it's terror, uh, terror that I couldn't even begin to imagine as a guy who can barely, uh, uh, you know, be anxious because that's just the way I grew up. I didn't have trauma. I did not have trauma in my in my early days, and uh, that's probably what helped me become a productive narcissist, which is the good kind of narcissist. <laughs> that's not a pathological condition, unlike Trump. Um, and uh, the, the they, those drugs do work, but they work as tranquilizers. Look, mm -hmm. if you have somebody who is so terrified that they're, you know, they, they, they think that if they're about to walk into an elevator, that there's nothing to sustain them there, they're gonna fall 20 story. I mean, if somebody is that, you know, messed up uh, and, and in turmoil and in interior, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're falling apart. 
if you give them Haldol or, or chlorpromazine or any number of other of the later uh, um, so-called antipsychotics, uh, they will feel better. And those drugs have worked, but they're not working because they're antipsychotics. They're working because they're tranquilizers. Right. Oh, I had, I had so many clients in that job who stopped taking their medicine and just smoked weed. Yeah, right. Well, that you know, can... because, because it calmed them down. I mean, it ended up being sure. a problem because if you're on probation, you got to give a urine sample every time yeah. you have a probation appointment, you know, which then leads to another set of problems. But, you know, th they couldn't function taking the antipsychotic medications that they were on. Right. Well, they're pretty much, uh, I mean, they're very heavy. They're called major tranquilizers as opposed to minor tranquilizers like the benzodiazepines. Right, right. Uh, and they really knock, they can really knock you for a loop. They can also give you these terrible side effects of, you know, target dyskinesia, dystonia. Mm -hmm. yep, and we yep. used to measure those uh, on our patients. There are actually scales where you can uh, determine um, and get a score as to how much uh, of, of this... Uh, bad side effect is happening, these uh, dystonic movements of various sorts. And there's actually, I don't know whether you watch television, I do too much, and uh, there's this drug out now that, that, that's an anti-TD um, uh, uh, drug. That you can actually get it's a drug now. Of now. We've had that, we've had that, let me, before I say that, it's not absolutely a new idea. We have drugs that, uh, 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 we gave to um, uh, uh, people all along for those side effects, but they weren't advertised on TV. I mean, this has one of those fancy, crazy, wacky names, you know, like they give to drugs. And uh, they have some woman who's up there saying she was, you know, twitching and so forth and took this stuff and, uh, you know, it, 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 it straightened her out. But uh, th these, are these, are, these are very dangerous drugs. And they've been sold to uh, uh, patients as something that they're not, even when they work, okay? They're the, the story that they're telling them about why they're working and what this means, you know, about their lives is wrong, okay? You know, something I realized, and I'm probably gonna have to do an edit on this because you had mentioned Dr. Meyer before, yes. and I have a little bit of an explanation about who he was for people who are not familiar with him. Okay, let's have Okay, it. because I yes. think this ties in and I'll have to do it in editing, which will be interesting because that's not my forte. But anyway, um, so I think it leads into a, a little bit deeper look in terms of your book about the four domains. So he, Meyer was the chief of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins. Right, School he, of was Medicine. The first, he was the inaugural psychiatrist there. He started the department. Okay. So he's the one who coined the term maladaptive reaction. Yes. That he believed was the underlying factor in most mental illnesses. Yes. That they are pathological choices that people make, defenses they invoke as they face challenges that they can't work through authentically. And so the DSM's mental disorders um, signify only that something's wrong. Right. And his term maladaptive reaction provides an opportunity to find out not only what went wrong, but why. Right. Okay. And exactly. replacing disorder with reaction, you say, is one of the key steps in creating a classification and diagnostic system. And that's what became the four domains of mental illness. Exactly. You got it right. Perfect. Okay. So how, and, and, and this is, you know, my audience really is, you know, super smart, highly sensitive creatives with a touch of trauma. So I'm okay. going to focus on that for a, in, in terms of trying to understand one piece of the book, because okay. we're never going to understand all of it, especially lay people who may not even have as deep of an interest as I do. So from a trauma perspective, you know, you begin to develop survival and coping mechanisms say people pleasing, say fight or flight, those kinds of things that, that are a result of early trauma that then, as we were talking about before, just evolve in, in their form as a habit and get into every area of your life until perhaps one day you're like, 
oh my God, what is wrong with my life? Everybody else seems to have normal relationships, a normal career, blah, blah, blah. What the hell is wrong with me? So how would you say the four domains of mental illness treats that as opposed to how the DSM would? Okay, now the, that, that falls into the uh, second perspective here. Now, let me, let me just read to you here my description of the second, second domain. Uh, maladaptive reactions of the second domain come about in the context of aberrant personality development and temperament. Biological factors contribute, but are not primary causes. See, there's always a biology and psychobiology. I mean, Meyer, we can't do anything without biology. We can't right. do anything without a functioning body. And when things go wrong, uh, this shows up in behavior and it shows up in emotion and cognition and the whole thing. Okay. So, what's in the second domain? And uh, I have, let me just read this to you uh, pathological personality styles. I borrowed a, uh, uh, the word style from, rather than disorder from uh, a psychologist whose name I can't pull out at the moment. And look, I had the, the, the major ones, narcissistic, antisocial, borderline, schizoid, schizotypal, histrionic, paranoid, obsessive, compulsive, uh, hypomanic, and avoidant. Now, let me tell you something. This is very interesting. Do you know that in, 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 in the DSM-5, there was a very big movement to get rid of access to disorders. The person, well, I'm sorry, the personality disorders which would fall in access to. That's, that's what I meant to say. And at the very last minute, they decided to um, uh, to keep them in because they were there was a lot of pressure to keep them in. And there were almost no changes at all between four and five in the personality disorder because they weren't working on it. They didn't think it was going to go through. And then what they did, they just dragged the personality disorders from four into five, okay? Now here, here's an interesting point. What's really behind this? Uh, what's behind this is they're, not, they're saying that these are not really mental disorders because why? Because there's no way anybody is ever gonna be able to connect that stuff with a brain, with a particular brain uh, snafu, okay? So they threw it out. That's a hideous thing, okay? And one of the uh, more, more horrific um, uh, things that could have happened uh, with this uh, DSM-5, and it, it did not happen, fortunately, okay? All right, and also under that um, second domain, uh, psychosomatic reactions, hoarding reactions. You ever seen a hoarder? You know, you know what yes. that is? All right, that's, that's something to see it. Um, and ADHD, all right, I have ADHD down here, and uh, uh, the... Uh, comment non that's a non phenomenon all right that's that's not what they say it is um, it's a bunch of stuff it, it doesn't it's a phenomenon in, in philosophy is something that is one thing and not another okay, okay. and that's what we, that's what the phenomenologists do and that's what i did in this book that's part of my training and part of everything that enters into my thinking and uh, you know working with patients and writing and everything the way i look at the world the world is constituted of phenomena. And uh, that is uh, something, that's how you study things. And these, these mental illnesses are phenomena. Depression is a phenomenon. Anxiety is a phenomenon. Anger is a phenomenon. Uh, and by the way, I've written articles about um, uh, these, all these phenomena and um, they're, uh, they're out there. They're getting pretty well read I belong to this academia edu thing. You know, you, you've probably you've seen my page on that, and they keep track of the uh, the people who uh, you know read these articles, and uh, they are um, they are reading them. So, so let's was, use let's take the ADHD thing as an example. So, you know, again, that is something that they throw medication at almost yeah. immediately. Oh, sure. And the thing is, you can medic. Here's the thing: you can medicate that. You, because these um, uh, um, uh, drugs work for that. They will, they're stimulants that they cause, it's kind of a paradoxical thing. They cause you to uh, sharpen your focus. Right. And students take them all the time for exams. Right. You know, if you it, I've never taken it myself, but you hear all the time. I mean, uh, that, that students are, are doing that. And, and what, is doing the, other things. what is the four domains perspective on ADHD? 
Uh, you know, I'm not really sure. Now, that's something I would have to admit that I am not a real expert okay. on, even though I think there's not that much to be an expert about. You know what I mean? I think it's much, much a, 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 an overblown thing. It's a mixture of things. It's, it's a real, one of the things uh, 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 that it is, it's just bad parenting. You know, these kids grow up and, and there's this horrendous situation going on between mom and dad. And, you know, this is their failure to adapt to this. And, you know, you, you can't really blame them because they're, they're so young. Their whole world is mom and dad. And they see mom and dad behaving atrociously. You know what I mean? And they develop anxiety from this. And some, some uh, uh, people use, this is almost a defense, you know, to uh, keep moving, basically. That's one way to deal with um, anxiety. There are many ways to deal with anxiety. Well, I think at its root, anxiety, as is almost any maladaptive symptom created by early trauma, is a feeling of not being safe. That's part of it. And it's also a feeling of not knowing who you are. Imagine okay. you know, being put in a situation where you don't know what's going on. If you don't know what's going on, you see, we're in this dialectical relationship with the world. Uh, this is another big thing in existential psychiatry. And the, 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 uh, uh, psychi the regular uh, biological psychiatry struggles with unsuccessfully because they just can't understand how one, every human being is related to a world out there in a dialectical open-ended way and how they respond to that, how, how they work that dialectic through is gonna be deter determined who they are. That, that's the determining factor, not the brain just alone. You know what I mean? Uh, but of course, there are brain things that are so bad that it is the brain a lot. There are, but right, that's right. rare. That's rare. Okay, like like autism, uh, uh, something else that I'm not terribly familiar with. You know, because I've never I've never had an autistic patient, so I have to be careful how I talk about this. But I have read about it, and uh, that is certainly. You know, there are some people who think that that's a, a reaction to bad parenting. Uh, and there may be something to that that may be a defense that they have, you know, uh, pulled themselves away from the terrible family dynamic and, you know, gotten into that world the way schizophrenics do. Uh, they create, they literally create a world of their own when they uh, face this terror uh, this, uh, of the worst kind of trauma you can imagine. But the, the thing that I had to realize this is that, um, uh, what a schizophrenic, a real schizophrenic experience is, is something that we cannot imagine unless we have some kind of introduction to that that is very, um, you know, specific. You have to, and, and most of the time, they don't listen. What these patients are saying is ignored by psychiatrists because they think it's nonsense. Okay, it's, that it make, that in other words, that it makes no sense. But the thing is, it does make sense but a different kind of sense. See, that's the psychotic world. And that's what a therapist who's working with um, schizophrenics has to understand. And this is something that Meyer was very good at and um, uh, uh, people who worked with him were good at it. And that, 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 that's why they uh, established the uh, fifth clinic. They did a lot of that um, uh, work there, that psychodynamic work and not believing that um, that uh, schizophrenia was a brain disease, as, as you know, they think now. And actually, there's very little evidence that, there, this, that uh, schizophrenia is a brain disease. You know, they have these brain banks um, where they uh, have lots of brains as people who have schizophrenia, and they really still haven't figured. I mean, they're, they're always changing, but nothing that they can point to and say, this is it. You know what I mean? Right. Like, people, we understand what Parkinson's is. We understand what, even though there's nothing they can do about it, they understand what part of the brain is being compromised and what the pathophysiology is. Uh, they, they don't have that in, in that knowledge of schizophrenia. They don't know what the pathophysiology of schizophrenia is, and yet they're still calling it a brain disease. And medicating it. And medicating it, sure. Yeah. Or they can they can medicate the symptoms because they can calm the people down so they don't have to go to these hysterical defensive lengths. See what I mean? In order to survive. Right. They can, they can do that. And they're, you know, a lot, 
a lot of these people who, who are doing this work and making big reputations off of it are, 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 are saying that is the case, that, that we, we know what we're doing when they don't know what they're doing. Do you know what I mean? Isn't that kind of the medical community in general? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll just say you know, you know, there's, a, there's a saying, there's a saying. Uh, the, the, the medical students show up, they're, they're talked to uh, the first day by the dean or whatever it is, and the dean says, well, you know, uh, guys, um, uh, about half of what we're, we're gonna, about to teach you is wrong. And the thing is, we don't know which half. Right. Well, and it's so true. And, you know, so, I mean, in all honesty, it is it is a symbiotic relationship between patient and doctor because the patient nine times out of 10 is looking for a black and white answer. Yeah, and sure. and most of the time, that's not possible. You know, if you have a sinus infection, you take an antibiotic. Well, they don't even give you antibiotics for sinus infections anymore. But that was, but I'll still use that as an example. But, but so many times you're like, I have this symptom and that symptom and that symptom. And, you know, people who specialize as di diagnosticians do their best to put the dots together and make it into some type of form so yeah. that they can give a diagnosis. But, you know... It's uh, the body. A lot of them, a lot of them do a poor job of this. Believe they me, they do. They, they do. do. Um, anyway, I kind of got a little off track there. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about too is that you know therapists are forced into using the DSM. Oh yeah, sure. You know because they've got to write down a diagnosis code in order for the insurance to pay for somebody's therapy sessions. Um, you know, it, it's the backbone of every psychiatric hospital. Oh, absolutely. You know, um, and I know change is slow, but, but where do you think we are as a society with beginning to dismantle? And let's just be honest, it's also part of the white patriarchy in this society because the people who've created the DSM, for the most part, are part of maintaining that patriarchy but how long do you think it, it's really going to take for any kind of sustainable change i'm surprised it's taken this long okay i okay. think you know you know and in the book i say this you know things have, as we said gradually then all at once okay that's do you remember right. the sexual abuse thing in the catholic church how that yes. happened I mean, that went on for years and years, and people denied it and you know, right, right. did all kinds of things, right. and bishops reassigned, you know, that whole awful story. And then uh, I think, it's, I forget what year it was, they had the, the yearly bishops meeting in Dallas. And for some reason, they had gotten these uh, sexual survivor people to be able to come and talk to the bishops. And then the Boston Globe got hold of it. Right. The and you know that film, if you've seen that uh, Spotlight film, which is wonderful. Uh, they they um, uh, did article after article, investigative article after investigative article on this priestly abuse thing. And then then it, it caught on, you know what I mean? People got the idea and they got very mad, uh, particularly in Boston where people tend to get madder than they get in right. other, uh, other places. And, uh, you know, they pushed that uh, cardinal uh, law out. He was, he was being talked about as the uh, uh, next pope, the, the first American pope. And he ended up in disgrace. He had to retreat to Rome. He, he couldn't live in Boston anymore. And that shows you how things can, uh, can change. Now, I am really surprised that, uh, that it's taken so long. You know, when they, um, I'm not sure I said this already, but when they put out the DSM-5 in uh, uh, 2013, they, they promised updates because they were still thinking that this biological thing was going to, you know, show a, a real cause for these things. And they said they would put out periodic updates and update the, the DSM-5 on the, uh, you know, the computer, the computer version. And the thing is, there have been no major breakthroughs in, since that time in mental health. Nine years in, later. Well, in understanding, in understanding. Right. Um, uh, uh, the cause of mental illness. You know, the, the one big development that has come along in psychiatry, and you're probably aware of this, Aaron Beck's um, uh, cognitive, uh, cognitive therapy. Are you familiar with that? Okay. That's probably, he was for real. 
um, he was uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. His daughter had carried on his work. I think she's a psychologist, I'm not sure. Or she may be a psychiatrist, I'm not sure. But uh, she has carried on his work. And that is meaning, you know, when you, when you understand that people over, are over investing in certain ideas, you know what I mean? The thinking is driving the emotion. That, right. that is for sure. And, with, and if you want to straighten out feelings, you know, messed up feelings that make criteria for mental disorders, you want to, one way to, one way, way in there is to look at the thinking and say, look, does this make any sense? You know, what, 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 how you're doing this? Does this make any sense at all? And a lot of times it doesn't. The shoulds and oughts, you know, and th this comes back to, you know, my interest in Camus. You know, the world owes us nothing. This is an absurd world. And people yep. think, and people who think the world owes me this and that and the other thing, you know, through people or through institutions or whatever. And when they get used to the idea that, no, they are not owed this. And, uh, uh, you know, the fact that they're in the hole that they're in uh, is, is partly their fault because they maladapted to the situation. You know, there's that great saying, if you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. Do you know yes. that? Yes. Okay. That, you could, I mean, that, that has very great psychiatric implications. And particularly with respect to uh, uh, cognitive, uh, uh, cognitive therapy. Well, and I think it's also, you know, it's a fine line because we're living in a, a woke century where if you're not, that can be an issue in certain circles. Um, and victim blaming is definitely a term that has, oh, yeah. you know, um, worked its way into the mainstream vernacular. So, and I, I will, I understand there's a fine line, but I have said for a very long time, the mirror is always and forever your best friend. Okay. Okay. So, you know, if you're behaving in a certain way, if you keep finding yourself in the same situation over and over and over again, you know, I think it's important to take a look at my participation and how I was involved in that situation or creating that relationship. Um, and, you know, I, I again, I, I think there's a fine line, you know? I mean, I'm at a point in my life with what I experienced in my childhood where everybody was doing the best they could. <laughs> you know? Did it hurt me? Yes, it did. Did it have an impact on the creation of, and we'll talk about this next, habits, you know, and, and the maladaptive behaviors? Absolutely it did. I just think at some point in time with maturity comes, I want to change this behavior or I want to change this habit or I want to change the way I navigate the world. And that's where I think a therapist who was using your book as a criteria for evaluation, as opposed to the DSM, might be able to help you weave your way through those stories, through those uh, personality styles, without there being the guilt and blame either on yourself or on somebody else. Right. Good. All right. This brings us. This brings us to uh, what we have. We have not discussed the F word, freedom. Okay, freedom. Now, this is a cornerstone of uh, existential psychiatry and existential okay. philosophy. I want to need to say just a few words about freedom. This comes from this uh, from Sartre, uh, from Heidegger, uh, and from a lot of other people who absolutely focused on this. Uh, you know, Sartre said we are condemned to freedom. That's it's a paradox. Uh, and it, what one of the things that mental illness is, is a misuse of freedom. And that fits the Meyerian uh, model beautifully. That's part of the maladaptive reaction, okay? It's a misuse of freedom. This psychiatry that the DSM sells basically denies freedom. And when you think about it, what's more unfree than a brain that's causing you to be mentally ill? Right. You see? Now, if you realize that most of what's going on I and mean, the first three domains, uh, uh, this is all a, a misuse of freedom of one kind or another. Okay? Interesting. That's a very important, that's a very important point. And one of the things that really, this is something that 
being um, uh, 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 a great partisan of Sartre and Sartre, and I had the same blood, a French Catholic father, German Protestant mother. Um, and I don't know whether that makes any difference, but I've always had this great affinity uh, for, um, and it's also Sartre was a Catholic as I was in the beginning. He blew it off and became the world's greatest atheist. Um, <laughs> and, and very interesting, you know, you say atheist, you think terrible guy, why anyone who didn't believe in God would be, a, you know, a terrible person. He and Camus turned that around and showed that there is a morality that can be built <coughs> out of their system. And it's at least as compelling as the Christian uh, uh, idea of morality. Well, I have it's an interesting philosophical point. Right. It has right. a lot to do with psychiatry, by the way. Well, I have a friend who pointed out, you know, I don't consider myself to be an atheist. Um but a friend of mine pointed out during a conversation about this several years ago that he does things, again, out of a moral compass, out of a sense of right and wrong, as opposed to out of a fear of going to hell. Exactly. Precisely. Yeah. Precisely. And when you really think about it, <laughs> it's more heroic to do it for that reason. Yep. Because it's really the, uh, you know, they talk about the Christianity of gimme, gimme, gimme this and that and that <clears throat> the non-theist version of that uh doesn't allow for that it's it's what you owe to and so it says i am my brother's keeper right you know? and he has this he and camus both have this extraordinarily um deep moral sense and both of them were total atheists <laughs> excuse me i just have to cough for a minute sure <clears throat> okay all right now i, I just let's talk about half um, this is something that's a very important part of uh, Meyer. It's also an enormously important, and I do this in the book, a very important part of William James. William James was the brother of Henry James, okay, the novelist. Mm -hmm. They were Boston uh, uh, Brahmins, and uh, William James was a Harvard MD. He was the first person to start a physiology lab on a university campus at Harvard. He later <clears throat> let that go and uh, went into uh, something more philosophical and psychological. He's known now for uh, 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 as a psychologist. And um, the his Meyer was very much influenced by um, uh, William James. This is something that Paul McHugh made me aware of, and I'm very glad he did. I, and uh, these guys say so. Just look, one important thing about habit is. The, the more good habits you develop, the more things you do instinctually without having to struggle, you know what I mean, uh, to do it, the, the, the healthier you are. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely, because everything is a choice, but not everything's a conscious right. choice. Right, so precisely, precisely. And you don't want to have to be making more choices than you need to about everyday stuff, you know, right. like how, particularly about how you're treating somebody else. I mean, if you're, uh, 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 you know, being horrible to another person, you're habitually horrible to that person. Mm -hmm. That's the way you do it day in, day out. You don't think about it. Uh, on the other hand, if you're nice and decent, uh, you know, to somebody, the same thing. You don't think necessarily uh, 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 that you're doing it. But it is, your, it is your habituality, and it's working for you, and it's working for the other person. So the, uh, really, you know, in a way, you can think of a lot of mental illness. Uh, the, the challenge that the patient and the therapist face is changing bad habits into good habits. Right, well, because um, a maladaptive reaction over time is a bad habit. You got it. That's right. The maladaptive reaction leads to the habit. You see what right. I mean? It forms it, gives it a certain form, and digs the hole for you, so to speak, makes the trench that you mm -hmm. get stuck in. Uh, so anyway, all right, let me uh, uh, just quickly go down this list, uh, which I do in the book about diagnosis. Story is important. The first thing you got to do when you, you know, whether you're in a, uh, a therapy room, private practice, or you're in the ER, you got to, the patient's going to tell you a story, okay, about you, 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 the first thing on a psychiatric evaluation in the ER is, uh, uh, why did you come in, you know? What's up? 
what's the or what's the presenting problem? They ask you that out in triage later. And that shows up on the thing that you get before you see the patient. And you get the patient's story. And uh, this can be a true story in the sense they're telling you what they really feel, or they, this can be manipulative, particularly yeah. in the ER, uh, because we have these drug addicts, the homeless, you know, they come in and they tell you stories that are just, you know, incredibly ridiculous. Uh, so you, you've always got to be on the lookout. Are, am I getting the true story from this patient? All right. And then from the story, you want to go to the facts. What are the facts of the story? Uh, you know, um, uh, my father is this way, my mother is that way, um, uh, I'm having trouble in school, you know, whatever, whatever the presentation is, you can list the, uh, uh, that would fall under complaints, really, in a way, you know. Uh, and then <clears throat> you got to look at how person's habituality, you know, the good habits they have, the are playing into all of this, okay. And you can you can you can do this even in the ER. It, it takes, as I say, a skill uh, to uh, be able to do this quickly and to focus it. And particularly if you come in, you know, you do a shift, and you may have three or four patients to see in eight hours or something, which means you've got to go from one to the other, from mm -hmm. one life to another, from one disposition to another. And and this is very good. This is very good training because it teaches you to focus and to listen. You know, and, and not just listen, but hear. And what, what are they saying? It also teaches you to ask questions so that you can get, you know, uh, uh, because pe people don't always tell you all you need to know on their own. You need to, it needs to be a dialectical relationship. You need to interact. Okay, and then what you wanna do from the bad habits, you want to identify the maladaptive reactions. Where did this patient go wrong in habits and uh, in, in dealing with what they had to deal with? And, you know, usually, again, when you have some experience, sometimes the patients are screaming at you. You know, they don't, I mean, I don't mean they're screaming, but they're, they're, they're just, they don't understand that you can see right through them. <laughs> you know, they're, you're, they're giving it up. They're giving it away. And that's what you want. And on the other hand, if you, if you don't get that feeling, you, you, you better ask yourself, are they trying to cover up? And what does that mean? See what I mean? All right, and then the, the, you want to go from the maladaptive reaction to the pathological phenomena. And that's what brings you to these categories in the uh, map of the four domains. Okay, that's how you get there. It's all spelled out in the book. Yes, and, and that will be very helpful. I will make sure I put that up, the documents that you sent me up on my website. Okay, and uh, really, I, I, since you did read the book, I really wish you would read that 33-page article. Okay. from the unit six psychologist. Uh, the, the way that happened was after I finished the book, I had other thoughts, you know, about this. Right. And I started a file called post FDMI. And I just kept putting all this stuff in that file. And it got to be, you know, quite lengthy. And then one day I decided, gee, I better, I should really sit down and put this material together. And I wrote that um, uh, uh, article. It's going to be, it's been online for a year. And it's coming out this month in the print edition of the Humanistic Psychologist for the fit they're having their 50th anniversary edition this year. Okay. Oh, that's well, that's a nice honor. And I've been I've been reviewing articles for them for four or five years. And actually, Scott um, uh, Churchill, who edits that, went to Duquesne and I knew him. So we've done a lot of very interesting things together uh, uh, in the intervening years. He's published uh, some very interesting articles of mine and, and done some things that no other editor would do to his credit. Uh, he has he has real courage. And uh, well that that's what very fruitful, is. very fruitful. And nobody else would publish a 33 page article. <laughs> that's just unheard of. But Scott would and it's the last it's it's the last um, uh, uh, article in the first volume, in the first issue of this volume for the 50th year. So that's um, wonderful. Okay. But I would appreciate your reading that because I was able to bring in some other things that I have learned okay. between other examples. And uh, I think it reads, um, uh, it, it reads cleanly. I worked on it to get it. I, I worked, I, I, I always think of the reader, I, uh, what kind of experience they're going to have. And I try to be considerate of the reader to do my job so that they don't have to do more than their job to read it. You know what right, I mean? Right, right. They don't have to struggle 
with my lack of uh, 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 doing what I should have done as a writer. So I, I strive for that. Okay, I've lost track of time. Where are okay, we? well, I, um, let me see. Uh, we talked about that. Let me see. Well, I think one of the things that, that I would like your, for, for people who are watching and listening to this, to, to get your perspective on is, you know, it's, it's amazing to me, and, and I don't know that it will ever stop amazing me before I draw my last breath, how much crap people carry around with them that is compartmentalized somewhere in that limbo between conscious and subconscious. Like, it's accessible in the proper scenario, um, but it's not something they think about on any kind of a regular basis. And I guess I'd always known that because I've always been the kind of person that people will just dump their whole life story on. <laughs> they feel safe with me, whatever it is. I can remember when I was working in New York, I'd get on the back of the M2 going down Fifth Avenue and I put my, this is back when there were Walkmans, put my headphones on. I'd sit in the very last seat of the bus with my feet up on the hump, which clearly says, leave me alone. <laughs> right? Right. And, and, but you mean they break through that? Oh, and they would sit right next to me and they would just start talking. Um, and these were, I mean, these were people who like had jobs. I mean, these weren't homeless people. These were people who just, for whatever reason, needed to purge right, something, okay. you know? And when I was working in that life coach position, I was amazed at what people shared with me that they had never told anybody else. Yeah, okay. Okay. I guess that makes you an empath. Well, you know, I kind of, okay, so that leads us to something else because I do my best to live my life without beliefs. Without what? Beliefs. Okay. Because a belief then becomes part of your identity. And when you're presented with conflicting information, you're not looking at changing your mind. You're looking at an identity crisis. So I do my best to keep an open mind and say, this is what I think now, but I am open. Because who knows what other information somebody might come to me with that could change my mind on this. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's what works for me. Having been raised as a Catholic and being told what the law was, <laughs> And then finding out, hmm, maybe not so much. Uh, this is kind of where I've evolved. And now I totally derailed myself and don't remember where the heck I was going. Um, that's terrible. Ah, I can't believe I did that. Uh, oh, the care of people carrying things around. Usually, at least in my experience, a lot of what people carry around that they don't talk about is not happy and joyous. Okay, it's the more painful, traumatic kind of things. You know, like I had shared with you, I had a client in that job who admitted to me that his father woke him up in the middle of the night, his stepfather, yes. in no. the middle of the night, took him to a country club and literally made him go down in the bucket into this well to get money so he could go buy booze. Holy shit. Yeah, like, right. What do you do with that? Right. You know? that's, that's tough. And, and here I am having zero training as a social worker or a counselor or anything going, all I can do is love this guy. That in this moment, that's all I can do for him is show him appreciation for trusting me with the story and that he's loved and cared for. I, I can't do anything from a psychological perspective. But people carry, like I said, they carry around so much stuff. Oftentimes I think rooted in, those, in what caused those maladaptive reactions. So how do you find a professional to help you if that stuff is burbling up in you and you're not quite sure what to do about it and you may not trust the western psychiatric medical model and you okay. don't want to take medication right uh, when <clears throat> when you were saying that i, I thought uh, immediately uh, there's a book called how to find a good psychiatrist it's written by a guy from texas 
And okay. I was asked by Rutgers Press to um, uh, pass on that book to uh, evaluate it. And I gave them two thumbs up. It was a very fine book. Okay. And now here's the deal. Here's the deal. He, that is a, a Trojan horse for pointing out all that is, that book, for all that is wrong in psychiatry. So I would suggest you read that. It's a very easy book to read. Uh, how to find a good, I'll, uh, <clears throat> I'll send you the exact title when I get home. Okay. okay. So that you can look up that. But that would be, he really goes into that. And okay. uh, I guess he couldn't come out and say it the, the way I did, doing psychiatry wrong. He took it from the other side. You know what I mean? And he did a very nice job. Okay, good. Of that. And um, basically, I guess but for, for how I would answer that question, um, you know, if somebody came to me, as they do, and asked me who could, uh, who I could recommend to do what I would consider even competent therapeutic work, I, there's one person I could suggest, one woman at Hopkins, uh, whom, whom I got to know personally a long time ago, and has since, you know, achieved some recognition and fame as a woman academician in psychiatry. One person. Isn't that pathetic? That's scary as hell. Yeah, that, that is scary as hell. Well, because, you know, I developed a questionnaire for myself because I've, I've probably had five therapists since the early 90s off and on. Um, what I found, and I don't know if other people find this, but between my personality and my interest in this subject, I ended up being their therapists. <laughs> like, they would start talking well, to me. About that's wrong. Show. All right. All right. Like, let me totally tell you wrong. Something. That's wrong. Right? That's wrong. But, but before I realized what was going on, it stroked my ego. Yeah, well, of course. Right? Because of course it did. They, here, here you, they you know, are. That's not, that, that's not only wrong. That's not only wrong. That's unprofessional. It's they totally could, unprofessional. They could lose their goddamn license for that. Right, right. You know? So, you know, the last person that I, you know, again, I develop a 510 question questionnaire because I want to know how they work. What? How do you feel about the DSM is one right. of the questions on that list you know so i'm really glad that you suggested this book because yeah. i've never like put that in writing or anything at, you know right i don't maybe i should i don't know just as a little I'll send, I'll, as soon as i get home i'll send you the name okay of the book. all right so i guess what i'd like to end with is let's focus on that f word because the freedom that comes from not be a being a victim, which means you're not blaming anybody. And to me, I mean, I still have maladaptive behaviors. Oh, we all do. To okay. Some degree. But my commitment to awareness has given me the, a level of freedom along with the no blaming. Not because, you know, I, I dated someone once who said, Everybody thinks that alcohol and drugs are America's biggest addiction issue. The biggest issue, addiction issue in America is to being a victim. Yeah, oh, you're right. absolutely. Oh, sure. And yeah. they were so right about that. Absolutely. And it's, it's so interesting because it weaves its way in such subtle ways that you don't even realize you're being a victim. You know, it's not like it's black and white. I, a priest molested me when I was a kid. That's pretty much a black and white situation. But, you know, somebody cutting you off in traffic, that doesn't make you a victim. That just puts you in the wrong place at the wrong time. Right. <laughs> you know? and, but, some people, but some people do become victims and killers of people who do that. You, you well, realize it. That is very true. And I mean, I've joked myself, you know, when I'm in my house, I'm all, I love everybody kumbaya, but put me behind the wheel, <laughs> get me out on the street. And with the insanity and absurdity that exists there, it yeah. is hard to hold your center. But the freedom that comes from dealing with this stuff is, is indescribable. And see, that, that's a theme all the way through this book. Right, because you through. make it dealable. You make it something that can be dealt with as opposed to a label that can shape, create some shame feelings, you know, like from the DSM, 
or some guilt or that what's wrong with me kind of thing, where when I read your book, I was like, well, this just fucking explains everything, <laughs> you yeah. know, which was such a joy and a relief. Okay. You well, know? I'd be really interested to see how you feel when you read that 33-page article I sent you, the PDF. Well, you article. haven't gone back on everything, have you? Oh, nothing. Okay. Oh, absolutely nothing. This is all an extension of it. Okay, good. Well, I'm very excited to, to take a look at it because, no, you know, a psychiatry, like any other modality, is constantly evolving. Medicine yeah. is constant, you know, the understanding of it. Right. Well, this evolved, as I said, that was, uh, I kept uh, putting these thoughts into this word file. And then finally, I realized I had enough for another article. And then it just, I didn't realize it was going to end up being 33 journal typeset pages. Right. But, um, I, 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 I'm very pleased with it. I'm, I, I really am. So yeah, well, I look forward to reading it. And okay. um, I mean, I, if you have any final words you'd like to share. Oh, no, I'd just like to thank Johns Hopkins for letting me use the uh, beautiful um, uh, room here and for setting up this Zoom thing, which my computer will not uh, tolerate. It's a beautiful day here in Baltimore. It's 45 degrees. Uh, we are on the Homewood campus. Uh, if you look out the window, you can see Gilman Hall, which is the major uh, uh, humanities academic uh, building. There are students all over the place. There were two girls passing out uh, pastries from, uh, thanks to the uh, Alumni Association. <laughs> so it's a real happening day here. On the other side is the Hopkins Beach, quote unquote, which is a sort of curvy uh, 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 space in the ground where they're all out, out there, I'm sure, uh, uh, having fun. So um, it was very nice to come over here and uh, do this here from the campus where I really learned my first existentialist. I just wish Ralph Harper were around to um, to see this. He'd be, I think he would be pleased. His own work, which was, he, he wrote a lot and he wrote, sometimes his stuff veered into psychology, but uh, he died before I got uh, started on this. So I'm, I'm just very sorry that he can't, uh, can't see this. So. Well, Ralph. I think what, you're, what you are doing and what you have done is such a critical step in the evolution of understanding how to deal with the human psyche. And I know it took us a minute to get this organized, um, but I am so glad that you were receptive and that you worked as hard as you did to make this come together. And I hope that people who have listened have gotten something out of it. Again, I will have the documents that you sent to me. I will okay. make them PDFs and there will be downloadable files on my website. And Wonderful. That's what I had in mind. That's what I had in mind when I sent them off. Yes, yeah, so yeah, because I can convert them to PDFs pretty easily. Beautiful. So, okay. and you know, my final word is, if you feel like your life is not where you want it to be, get the book Dr. Muller recommended about how to find a good psychiatrist. That title will also, I'll, I'll have a right. page on my site about all of yeah. this. Right. Um, and, and ask for this to help and support. Okay. And thank you, Stacey. I couldn't have had a better partner in doing this. Okay. It was well, fun working with you. And I hope we'll do some more some later on. That would be great. Some All right. On. Thank you so much. Take okay. care. Bye. Bye. <clears throat> thank you so much for watching this interview. And again, I cannot say enough that if you don't feel like your life is where you want it to be, I will have the questionnaire that I use for therapists also as a PDF on my website. The title of the book Dr. Muller recommended, there are ways for you to reach out and get the help you need in a way that will be a fit for you. So don't hesitate and thanks so much for hanging around.